Hello everyone, welcome back to the Boohoo Review. I'm finally back uploading again. Um, for me, it doesn't feel like I've sort of been away because I've still been recording, editing, you know, putting all things together, practically working on it every day. So for me, I've still been at it. I just haven't got around to uploading because I've been really busy these last two weeks. And also, I've really tried to put a lot of effort into this video because this is a video I've known I've wanted to do before I even probably set up my channel because I feel like John Nathan Turner in his era, he's a very interesting man and I feel like there's a lot of interesting things about his era of the show. I mean, the contrast between the beginning and the end and there's a lot of interesting stuff in the middle. So I really wanted to focus on that and I really wanted to do a video about John that sort of like explains who he is because I was really fascinated with him, just about about him and his decisions about Doctor and everything. So, and when I was looking to find out stuff about him, I didn't really find vi videos on YouTube that were really like in depth. So I wanted to try and do an in depth video for people like myself who are interested to know who he is and all of like his decisions on the show. Also, you might have noticed behind me, I've got a new addition to my room behind me. I hope you like it. And also soon something very interesting is going to be happening to that wardrobe. So keep an eye out for that as well. But um, yeah, without no further ado, let's get into the video and find out who John Nathan Turner is. John Turner, known later on as John Nathan Turner, first sought to be used professionally in January 1968, was born on the 12th of August 1947, and was known most famously for being the longest running and final producer of the classic era of Doctor Who. His reign began in 1980 with The Leisure Hive and ended in 1989 with Survival. He also created characters such as the 5th Doctor, 6th Doctor, 7th Doctor, Adric, Tegan, Perry, Mel and Ace to name a few. Known best for his love of Hawaiian t-shirts, love for pantomimes and controversial decisions under his reign. It wasn't just his Hawaiian t-shirts and love for pantomime he was known for, he was also known for his catchphrases too. One being stay tuned to signal something good was coming and I was persuaded to stay. This one focused on how he wanted to move on from Doc 2 but was left with what must have felt like, no choice, as no one saw him as being able to do anything other than Doctor Who, as was him leaving would have meant the BBC would have most likely cancelled the show earlier as what was suggested by them, this being backed up by the fact that they did try back in 1985. His parents, Samuel, known as Sam, and Catherine, known as Kath, met during the war and married in 1944, where they then settled in the suburb of Birmingham. John was an only child and was said to be very proud of him, in turn, he wanted to show them he was doing well. Their marriage faced uncertainties, but they remained together for the rest of their lives. John was particularly close to his mum, who suffered from serious mental health problems, and John would often have to travel up to Birmingham to deal with her care. John, having passed his 11 plus exams, gained entry into King Edward VI Aston Grammar School. It was one of the most top high schools in the city, with him joining in September 1958. John gained to the nickname Turner the Bunsen Burner in which throughout his life he gave friends and enemies their own, as well as gaining friends as well, specifically Roy Hawksford, who both shared an interest in Doctor Who. Roy says they used to find William Hartnell amusing, as he was fairly poor as an actor in their opinions. John persuaded the school to put on their first ever pantomime, with him organising it, an early sign of his love for them. Once he left, his first job was as a stage manager in the Castaway nightclub. Then after, in Christmas 1966, he became the property master on the year's pantomime at Alexandra Theatre, which starred Wednesday Padbury, Zoe, companion to the second Doctor. A couple of years later, a man named Tom Cornish, producer of BBC United, suggested he apply for a general exploratory interview with the BBC, and so began his loyalty with the BBC and his path to becoming producer of Doctor Who. His history of the show began in 1969 as floor assistant when Patrick Troughton was the Doctor. Many friends recount how thoughtful and caring he was, being a very generous man, who was the life and soul of the party. He also loved his mother and father deeply, with many lifelong friends such as Ian Fraser, Fiona Cummings and later on Mark Jones to name a few. John Nathan Turner was an openly gay man who showed no signs of ever struggling with his sexuality, despite his mother not holding back on her opinions on gay people. The BBC was said to be fine with people being gay as long as they were out to stop people being blackmailed with it. His partner Gary Downey, born on the 17th of July 1940, were in a relationship from the summer of 1972 to John's death. Gary was disliked by many and for good reason, known to refer to women as fish and often rile j and up against people. Many of John's friends often wondered what he saw in him as they were such opposite people with Janet Fielding only socialising with John after she left Doctor Who, never seeing another side to Gary. 
Colin Baker said Gary held him back and Fiona Cummings recalls him making appalling comments about women. Gary and John first shared a place in Clapham, then later Brighton, where they kept a lot of Doctor Who memorabilia. John was said to be a great host with a flamboyant house and always did the cooking and enjoyed it too, despite Gary being the one to put together the Doctor Who cookbook, thought to be an excuse to give Gary a reason to be at conventions. John smoothed the way to him joining the BBC as an AFM, assistant floor manager. It is known that once John died, many of their friends stopped contacting Gary, as it most only liked John. He lived to see the revival of Doctor in 2005. He believed J&T would have liked New Who, and having said John would have done a lot of things New Who did, if he was given the chance and the budget. John shared a relationship with a woman, despite being gay. He referred to her in his memoirs as a girlfriend. Liz Rowell, 33, and John shared a relationship so serious, friends of John's recall him contemplating whether to leave Gary or not. On a holiday they booked together, when Gary was away, John decided it wasn't for him and he said him doing it behind Gary's back was what was the exciting part about it and decided to stay with Gary. In 1979, Graham Williams, producer of Doctor Who at the time, had a very on but mostly off relationship with the Doctor of the time, Tom Baker, who was famously known to be difficult to work with. Graham drank heavily to keep up with Tom. Tom would often do his own thing and not stick to the script whatsoever. Tom Baker also had an on-off relationship with companion Layla Ward. It was this cocktail of problems in which Graham decided to confine in John that he was going to quit. Others were considered but the job went to J&T with Tom Baker being told right before John, with John coming in straight after Tom Baker and Graham Williams saying, Your time has come John. I would like you to produce Doc 2 and I've told that man. When news got round to various production members, he'd be taken over Doc 2, such as script editors and director. It was a positive response. The first thing John did was buy a black leather patch coat and grow a beard to look older and get more people to take him seriously. He originally wanted to change the fourth Doctor's look even more than he already done so, wanted to remove the scarf completely, but he was persuaded not to. By now he already made radical changes to the title sequence and theme, as well as adding the question mark logos. Tom Baker also wasn't sure on Matthew Waterhouse's Adric as he's known as casting. Matthew once swore at Tom for being difficult on set and Tom was quiet for the rest of the day. Tom would often threaten to leave, but this time John called his bluff and agreed, with it being announced Tom would be leaving on the 24th of October 1980. Despite all of this, John Nathan Turner and Tom Baker went on to being friends later on in life, with Nicholas Courtney, known in Doctor as the Brigadier, helping by being a mutual friend. J&T had many problems with Barkers as he called them. Fans would leak information as visiting sets was a much more open thing than it is now. John attempted to tackle the fan glitterati as he called it and stamp it out where he could, with him sometimes writing stuff on a board in his office to find the source. One of the most well-known ones was the episode titled The Doctor's Wife, which was planned to never be made until 2011 where Stephen Moffat, showrunner of the time, decided to use it for one of his episodes. Another incident involving J&T was with Vincent Rodzicki in the infamous Longheath Convention, the biggest Doctor Who convention of the 80s. Vincent refused to shake J&T's hand after receiving several insults during the day from him. John started to shout, Thief! 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 after Vincent called him out and wanted to keep sets private despite showing them off to fans, in which John then goes on to insult British fans. John was always looking beyond Doc 2 and wanted to get on with other projects off the ground, such as creating a rival to Coronation Street the BBC were looking for at the time, which of course became EastEnders. John's ideas were called Compact, Catwalk and Lives, all rejected. The only successful commission outside of Doctor Who was a spin-off in 1981 called Canine & Company starring Elizabeth Sladen. However, it only lasted one episode. John cast Peter Davison as the next incarnation, some people being keen to point out him not having the eccentricity Tom Baker had. John came up with a costume idea from a picture he had from All Creatures charity cricket match of Peter Davison. John didn't tell Matthew Waterhouse he was leaving and find out from Peter Davison. Davison also recalls having to do pantomimes and having to spend Doctor Who rehearsal times doing them. Jane T's golden years as producer were between 1982 and 1984. He had many obstacles to overcome, such as industrial action, a real issue at this time, and scheduling issues with Peter Davison, but he stayed absolutely devoted to the show. Come the end of the Davison era of the show, John was not surprised Davison did not want to stay for a fourth series, although Peter has said that if he had better stories such as The Caves of Androsari, then he might have stayed longer. John being a man not afraid of change was planning to write out Davison and both companions, Tegan and Vizsla. John decided to cast Colin Baker who he met at a party and felt it was a great fit for the Doctor through that. He also chose Nicola Bryan playing Perry Brown. 
who had to put on a fake American accent and wear some more skimpy clothing, as well as not reveal her to be married in the real world. Another of John's most controversial decisions that Russell T. Davis, past and future showrunner of Doctor Who, called the greatest mistake in television history, who John later goes on to say it was totally his fault as he kept rejecting designs that were a little laid back and wanted something totally tasteless, was of course the costume for the sixth Doctor. As already mentioned, he also got the stars of the show to appear in pantomimes simultaneously with the filming of Doctor Who. Nicola Bryant as punishment in her own words for wanting to refuse doing the pantomime at the same time as doing 18 hour days for Doctor Who was not put in a specially written minisode A Fix Was On Tyrants. Instead, Janet Fielding, Tegan Javanka, was the companion instead, having the misfortune with Colin Baker to appear in it with the repulsive Jimmy Savile making a regrettable, to say the least, appearance. This wasn't the only incident involving Nicola Bryant and John Nathan Turner. A misunderstanding about a joke involving Nicola Bryant sleeping with a gay man, which never really happened, meant that John, who was filled with rage and jealousy, spits in Nicola's face, which after this they never spoke again. Nicola was upset John would have believed she slept with a gay man and believes they would have forgotten and forgiven if it wasn't for Gary. It was also in 1983 during December, the head of drama series and serials at the BBC changed too, to Jonathan Powell. This was the beginning of tough times for John as Powell was not a fan of Doctor Who or JNT and wanted both him and the programme gone. As the show progressed into a new era, this wasn't the only problem JNT faced. It was also Mary Whitehouse who had been a vocal critic of Doctor Who for its violence. This era of the show she criticised parts like when a man's hands are crushed by Cybermen to acid baths with the Doctor making light of it. By 1985, Doctor Who faced cancellation from the higher-ups, although John denies it ever happened. The idea came up to create the infamous Doctor in Distress, known for being horrendous and filled with celebrities most didn't even know who they are. Even the Doctor himself, Colin Baker, regrets doing it and found it hard to say no to John. In the end, the possibility of fans storming the Houses of Parliament in Dalek costumes and fears it would reverberate around the world helped to turn the cancellation into a postponement, meaning John was still going to be producing the show. The man responsible for this near cancellation in 1985 was Michael Grade. He became BBC controller in 1983 and stepped down in 1987, with the position going to Jonathan Powell. He was not a fan of sci-fi and very clearly did not like Doctor Who whatsoever. Speaking to John about the show, he asked John if he watched E.T. and Star Wars, in which he replies yes. With Michael Grade then going on to say, I've got news for you, so have our audience, and what we're serving up is sci-fi garbage. He also did not like the violence showed in this era and felt the show was a waste of licence fee payers' money. He was the one who pulled it up against Coronation Street and the one who not long from now gave John an ultimatum between the show and the main star. With Nicola Bryant having left, he chose Bonnie Langford as the next companion with the knowledge she was good at screaming, another of John's controversial decisions on the show which raised eyebrows. Colin was also under fire from the press at the time, with them being unkind to him about putting on weight since the last season. Several things about the new season, A Child of the Time Lord, fell through and what is known to be a boring concept got worse. An original idea for a cliffhanger of the season was the Doctor to be trapped with the Valiard in the Matrix and it would have been unknown if he survives, but JNT rejected it wanting it to be clear the show would be back the next season. There was a lot of back and forth about it and some believed it wouldn't have mattered how it ended. If the BBC wanted to end it, then they would do it regardless. He also faced an interview from Eric Sawood, which originally lasted two and a half hours which the interviewers felt they could not publish most of it. What did come out, John shook with rage, as he said he couldn't believe he would do something like that and even considered taking legal action. To this day, Colin Baker hasn't met with him because he felt betrayed. Jonathan Powell was happy to hear this and saw it as another nail in the coffin for Doctor Who. Months after Trial of the Time Lord went out, he thought his time on the show was over. He said in his memoirs he was exhausted mentally and emotionally. Once John learned of his time on the show being extended once again, he was told a new doctor was needed. John took Colin out for lunch, in which he says to Colin, there is good news and bad news. The good is that doctor is back for another year, and the bad is you need to be recast and do four episodes. Colin Baker refused, and refused to film his regeneration scene, as he felt betrayed, which he now regrets not filming. John was very good at publicising Doctor Who, threatening to do away with the police box exterior, in fear youngsters would not know what it is, as he puts it. He also occasionally threw out the chance it could be a woman, who takes on the next incarnation, started up by Tom Baker to get people talking. It was around this time he was doing far too many conventions, flying back and forth to America, where he had to cut corners such as getting Gary to read scripts to him in the car. For example, Bonnie Langford went to America for a convention with John before she even read a script, and Sylvester McCoy, the next Doctor, was announced on the Monday and arrived in Atlanta on the Thursday. 
Speaking of convention, Anthony Ainsley, known for playing an incarnation of the master, was paranoid he was getting paid less and being cheated. Him and John did not get on at all. At Coventry Convention in 2001, him and John broke out into a blazing argument in front of attendees and Stuart's had to usher out the fans. Eric Sawood formed a series of complaints about Doctor Who stories being shown in America. Eventually, the BBC paid conversation at this time the bubble had burst in America, this moment being one of the factors bursting the bubble. John could have made it in the States, but he had to care for his mother. However, thinking internationally helped Doctor Who's profitability and he was very good at promoting the show to bigger audiences. John wanted Sylvester McCoy to be the Doctor, but the higher-ups of the BBC wanted others. McCoy was up against Dermot Crowley and David Fielder, but John manipulated it to make sure McCoy got the part as he was adamant he was going to get what he wants and not let the people upstairs get what they want. Again, John from Powell did his best to put the show in danger by putting it up against Coronation Street, John's favourite show, knowing nothing got an audience when against Corrie. He also hired Sophie Aldred called Ace. She had little experience but John worked on instinct, with McCoy giving his thumbs up. Relationships between Sophie and John were good until the Dorset location shoot of The Greatest Show in the Galaxy. Once she asked him not to smoke because she had a big scene coming up and it made her feel awful, so when he found out he deliberately lit another. Later on she said goodnight to him and he ignored her saying goodnight to the other actress Karen Glidhill playing Alison in The Remembrance of the Daleks but again deliberately not her. He and other big stars of the time such as Colin Baker were subject to much scrutiny from fanzines. At first fans welcomed him with open arms but as his time on the show progressed with what was seen as more and more controversial changes being made fans began to scrutinise him relentlessly. Doctor Bulletin was probably the most famous for its harsh takes on John and his era of the show, particularly season 24, the least watched and most criticised. John admits in his memoirs he found the titles and magazines hurtful. It was also the fanzine done by Gary Lee that created Operation Who to remove JNT from the show. The BBC solicitors wrote to Gary Lee for him to make an apology but refused and published his response. John could be an insecure and sensitive man, unhelped by the pressure cooker that is the show of the time Doctor Who. Not long after, in the same year, he received more hate for his take on the show. He appeared on the BBC's Open Air Feedback programme, where the fans and presenter Patty Cadwell didn't hide their confusion on the show's direction. John became stuck with Doc 2. No one wanted it, as it had become a bit of a joke, and no one wanted him, because he was typecast in a way to the show. People believed he could only do Doc 2 and nothing else. Whilst 1989 to Whovians is known to be the year Doc 2 was cancelled, it was, however, put on an indefinite hiatus at the time. Officially, he left the programme for a resignation letter on the 31st of August 1990, the same day the production offices for the show were shut down. Sylvester McCoy does say that although he did not know it was the last scene of the classic Doctor Who, he could feel a sense of finality to it. Sophie Aldred was told by Sylvester McCoy that it wasn't coming back next year, who was also gutted. Jonathan Powell admits he did not have the courage to cancel it, and what he did which was killing it slowly, was cruel in his words. Now with Doctor officially cancelled, John had many ideas he tried to get off the ground, but all were rejected. He now sat in a production office filled with pictures from a dead series. On the 14th of February 1990, he was called in for a meeting where he was told he would be made redundant, age 43. This was hard news to take being a BBC man through and through. His only insecurities also led him to believe Doctor Bulletin was to blame, but he was assured that they had no connection to the cancellation. In a way that was unlike John, he declined a leaving party due to the finality of them, hoping he would be back, but he never did make it back to the BBC, although a party was thrown for him anyway. After he left, he got a few small jobs such as at Brighton Radio, but nothing as big or nowhere near as close as Doctor Who. He did, however, continue to make contributions to the Doctor Who world, like video projects. There were other projects like Space Station, where he had a pilot presented by Sophie Aldred and DWAS Andrew Beach, though this stalled. He received many letdowns but was called for an interview with EastEnders as series producer but it came to nothing despite some interest from them. Come 1993, Dimensions in Time, a two-part 30th anniversary special for Doctor Who was produced. John wanted to be the director and be in charge of it but it was done by Stuart MacDonald and there was a clash because of this. John wanted the main focus to be on Doctor Who but the main idea was for a 3D demo with Doctor Who's involvement being second. Gary was also involved being a production manager which of course caused friction. The whole idea of EastEnders being involved was because Gary was working as a production manager on EastEnders. Gary did promise John a chance to get onto EastEnders, but Gary didn't stay long either, and this marked the end of his television career, then becoming a psychotherapist.
And by 1996, it was announced an American feature-length Doctor Who movie would be happening with a possible series after. John was in a car with Sylvester McCoy on the way home from a Doctor Who exhibit, and Sylvester McCoy told him it's his last day as the Doctor. The Seventh Doctor dies today with Paul McGann taking over, which they all got emotional about. John did watch the TV movie. He loved Paul McGann's Doctor and the production values, but hated the story and, above all, the Doctor being half-human. John continued to not manage to get things off the ground. He would get more depressed, and so he drank, and the more he drank, the more depressed he got. There was a huge drinking culture at the time, and both Nicola Bryant and Sophie Aldred recall this, with Nicola Bryant saying how she once had to bribe a barman to only give her soft drinks. In the 90s, John started to grey, which he died in, and had a non-malignant cyst removed from behind one of his ears, which he joked he had a mini facelift, although this was a very serious operation, as complications could have meant death. His parents' health started to deteriorate. His mum, Kate Turner, began to become almost permanently confined to a specialist nursing home, sometimes not talking at all. His dad suffered a stroke but continued to live alone. Again, unfortunate events almost led to his death once again when his TV caught fire. However, Sam Turner survived but died in 1996. John moved his mother to a nursing home after that. John's friendships kept him going and the caring side of John continued on, often on the phone to his friends for hours cheering them up. Ron's friendship being Nicholas Courtney. They were both big drinkers and apparently loved to gossip too. John also helped Nicholas Courtney through his tough times of depression and John was the best man at his wedding. It was also this time in John's life when a fight broke out between Gary and a man called Michael Percival, who Janet Fielding was living. Janet felt it was best to not be involved with this type of people and lost touch with John. This event happened at Jane Wensley House, who too, after 20 years of their friendship, came to a sudden end. She didn't want to go up to Brighton one weekend because it was one of the only times she could see her partner and John and Gary dropped her as a friend because of this. A friendship which ended it in a very Gary-esque style was David Roden's. He was the manager of the theatre and invited John and Gary to be involved. They worked with him on one production and he invited them the following year for a production of Aladdin. In which was typical in Gary's life, he was accused of making a pass at a 14-year-old boy who was undressing under the stage while Gary was there. The parents did not make much of it and it eventually came to nothing, whether it was true or not. John, however, was upset David followed up the accusation. This wasn't the only incident, however, as at another time John was so full of rage and anger he exploded and threw a plate which was the closest thing to him and it smashed near someone just as they were walking in the room. After not speaking, David then received a phone call from a mutual friend in which he felt he was on loudspeaker with John and Gary listening in. When he was asked to give John and Gary a call, he refused, saying if he acted the way John did on one of his sets, he would never have forgiven him. Although they did have a bit of a chat at conventions, Gary would always be hostile and very vile, telling him to get away. David believes things would have been fine if it wasn't for Gary. It has also been alleged John and his partner Gary showed inappropriate sexual behaviour towards the male fans of the show, aged 17 and over, with the age of consent being 21 for gay men and 16 for heterosexual relations. One fan recounts Gary tying his shoelaces to the table leg, with John undoing his trousers whilst the fan was being held down by Gary, in which he then manages to escape. Other fans, however, recall John backing off once they had made it clear they were not interested. Again, showing John's good side, he once sent a friend, their hairdresser, Barry Hannum, a £5,000 cheque to help him out during difficulties with his business. It was never cash, but he always knew he could rely on John and Gary. Come the new millennium, in 2000, John was invited by Big Finish to do an audio version of his memoirs, in which he instantly said yes, which originated in 1996 in Doctor Who Monthly. When coming to record it, John made many mistakes practically on every line according to Nick Briggs. It was also this time Gary got diagnosed with cancer. Though he went through tough treatment, he entered remission, but due to the worry of his health and John not wanting to go last, he became even more of a heavy drinker. This time it had gone too far and John became very ill. He started to turn yellow and he knew he would never get a transplant although he did give up both smoking and drinking despite a few relapses. John's mother died in 2001, aged 79, with John, despite having just recently received the news, emailing a friend with some advice of how to get better as she was ill too. Despite going through gruelling tests for his health, he still had to manage to arrange his mother's funeral. John and Gary decided to buy a three-storey house close to Benidorm with the main reason to build and run their own theatre. It was a quiet village and there would not be much of an audience, but it was believed it was something for John to focus on and believe in. They were also getting the house decorated to celebrate John's 55th birthday and 30 years with Gary, although they never made it that far. Janet, Peter and Sarah Sutton called up John, who was pleased to hear from them, but as Janet remembers, little did they know it was the last time they'd ever hear from him. 
In 2002, on the 15th of March, John went to make his only appearance in the Doctor Who DVD range. When the interview ended, he said to himself, I told you I could do it, despite getting very angry at fluffing a few words. On the 20th of March, he was put on the transplant list for a new liver. The straw that broke the camel's back with John's health was a bite they got in Spain, which due to John's condition quickly got infected. He got blood poisoning and his body couldn't fight it off. His legs became swollen and blistered, which needed redressing constantly. He did, however, manage to attend the Batterford Convention in Coventry on the 30th and 31st of March. He had to be wheeled in a wheelchair and looked gaunt with the whites of his eyes gone yellow. They were meant to go up to Spain to recuperate, however, he was admitted to hospital and still persisted to go on with things. He had visits from people such as Tom Baker. Things got so bad he had to get his foot amputated. He went back for a weekend to his home, but was rushed back to hospital again. He was moved to a high dependency unit, but there was nothing which could be done. Gary had to make the difficult decision to switch off the machine, keeping John Nathan Turner alive. Thankfully, they had discussed it before, and neither wanted to be a vegetable. Gary kept talking to him as the last thing to go was the hearing. John Nathan Turner died on the 1st of May 2002 at 1.30pm. Age 54, his death certificate stated he died of multi-organ failure and alcoholic liver disease. Many people were sad to learn of his death, including Matthew Waterhouse, who heard it in the Telegraph. John was also said to have made up with a lot of people before he died, but one of those not being Nicola Bryan, who decided with Colin Baker it was best she did not attend the funeral because of Gary. The funeral was held at Brighton's Woodvale Crematorium at 12.45 on Thursday, the 9th of May 2002. It was no ordinary funeral. Huge crowds, some dressed in Doctor Who costumes, not enough room for everyone to sit down. Sylvester McCoy and Sylvia Aldred came in Hawaiian t-shirts in tribute. Andrew Beach organised a floral tribute with a TARDIS key on top which was stolen. The funeral had an Elvis Presley tribute act with Nicholas Courtney, Louise Jameson, Colin Baker and Tom Baker giving tributes. For Gary, once the funeral was done with, the once busy social life soon ended, with him coming to the realisation most people were there for John and not for Gary. Most, such as Tom Baker, never got in contact with Gary again. Only a few stayed in touch with Gary, such as Ian and Fiona, Mark Jones and Lorne Martin. Gary did an interview spread over two issues of Doctor Who Monthly about John, where he set the record straight in his view, but with it issued denials and scorn. He also claimed John hated the show in the end and hated the fans. Quoting Gary, he said, They all think they can do it better. They're working at Tesco Service Tills or as a warehouseman, but they know how to produce the show better than John. It's rumoured by some that John deliberately brought about the demise of Doc 2 to set himself free of it. However, despite having wanted to leave years before it was cancelled, friends and colleagues have been keen to point out how much effort he put into the show, even with the incredibly low budget. John's financial affairs were a mess, but he was very thoughtful to Gary before he died. He left notes for him around the house, and parcels kept coming for Gary ordered by John from him before he died. Gary was faced with a huge inheritance tax bill. He tried to throw out a load of tapes from Doc 2, but Graham Flynn made sure this did not happen. Gary did, however, rip up props from the show and leave them lying about, although luckily he did sell some and give scripts to the BFI. Gary also used to dream about John and call them visions in which he spoke to him. Gary was known to be a very spiritual person. Gary's cancer returned in 2005. It spread fast and decided to remarry to avoid the taxman getting any more money on the 22nd of December 2005. He cared for this new man, but it was nowhere near what John and Gary shared. He died on the 16th of January 2006, and it was very low-key with none of his family attending. His obituary in DWM, like Anthony Ainsley, was difficult to find someone to write because people struggled to find anything nice to say about Gary. Gary thinks John would have liked New Who, which Gary thought was great. Andrew Cartmel believes John would not have stood for Catherine Tate, quoting what he could picture John saying, Get rid of that old trout and get some totty on there. His life certainly wasn't dull with the life and scandalous times of John Nathan Turner, the book being written by Richard Marson, certainly not having the word scandalous in there for no reason. Love him or hate him, it was important to recognise the man behind the title of producer of Doctor Who, something us fans sometimes forget to do, and see the caring but flawed, controversial but driven man. There's Jane T and there's John. Jane T was fighting an uphill battle with Doctor Who, and it's important to recognise all this, and recognise the man behind it, John. Friend, son, partner. And that's everything there is to know about John Nathan Turner. I tried my best to keep it as detailed as possible, but it is very difficult to sum up someone's life in just one video alone. I tried to keep all the important parts in and keep it very focused on John and obviously Doctor Who and the content related to that. Um, 
my personal opinions on John, obviously I never met him, of course. I would be interested to meet him and see what sort of man he was, because you only really hear about John through other people, so it'd be interesting to see the man himself. But my thoughts on John as a person, I mean, he definitely had his flaws. Uh, he's He did seem like a very caring man. That's something that I really did notice when doing the research. He did seem like a very caring person. He did have, like, a bad side to him as well, which was amplified by Gary, I would say. But from what I've gathered, he was a very caring person, a very nice person. Talking to more like the JNT Doctor Who person, JNT himself. He was also good. I mean, there's a lot of things that I would say that I liked what he did in the early era of his show, specifically like the early Fifth Doctor era, like the Five Doctors and then Peter Davison, I like his Doctor. And um, just I like the titles and everything. So there's a lot of things that I do like. But as we move down the line of his era, I feel like it's not as good, obviously. And it's just like, I like Jane T early on in his Doctor Who career. Later on, I don't enjoy it as much. But he, he, I mean, he does have to take some responsibility being the producer of the show. However, you could tell that he wasn't getting any support. It was an extremely low budget. There was just not really any support, any sort of help. And it's just like, yeah, he made the decisions, but also he wasn't receiving any help and people were sort of like trying to get the show ended. So he, he was fighting an uphill battle. So I do feel sorry for him in a way because, you know, he was trying his best, I think. And he was very tired and exhausted. I mean, his era on the show lasted 10 years. I mean, Stephen Moffat's lasted seven, but 10 years. And don't forget, he wasn't receiving any support. So it's quite, it was quite a struggle for him. So, so yeah, so that's how I feel about J&T himself. But Johnny seemed like, he seemed like a nice person most of the time. And um, yeah, it, he's a very interesting character, I must say. I have spoke about this on my channel once before, but it is quite relevant. And I do want to bring it up again because I, I really do like this. But um. I received this from um, Martin Fisk. Um, he was a Vargos in the Leisure Hive, um, JNT's first episode he was producer of. And um, I just wanted to show this off quickly because it is sort of related and I do really love it. I know I've spoke about it once before, but I do really love it. I'm actually going to get it framed soon and pull it up somewhere. But um, I just thought I'd share that with you because obviously it's quite related to uh, JNT and the classic here and all of that. But yeah, that's something that I wanted to show you guys again. Also, while we're on the subject of um, Martin Frisk and the Leisure Hive, um, he's, his son actually gave me a very interesting story about Layla Ward during filming. Um, so they were rehearsing and she was reading a book. She wasn't engaging at all. And when they called her for her line, she apparently just put the book down, walked up with no emotion, just read her line out and just went to sit back down. And I think she also walked out as well not long afterwards and they had to fill out her part. So I think that's very interesting as well how how things are very different. I feel like Doctor Who filming now, all the cast get along really well. They do put a lot of effort into it. So it's very interesting that part of the JNT era as well, where he first come in, because I feel like Tom Baker was sort of fed up with it and sort of was definitely doing his own thing. Layla Ward was also, I think, a bit fed up with it as well. And then obviously Matthew Waterhouse, there was that tension between him, Layla Ward and Tom Baker. So it's a very interesting part that as well, not just JNT's later era with like, Colin Baker and Sylvester McCoy but also at the beginning with Tom Baker that's an interesting part as well but I just thought I'd share that story here in that first hand. I have spoke about this on my channel once before but if you're interested in John Nathan Turner and learning more about him then I definitely recommend The Life and Scandalous Times of John Nathan Turner. This is in no way a paper promotion it's just genuinely a really interesting and fascinating book. I remember I spent about £50 for it. I think it's because I bought it around the 20 year anniversary of his death, which I think is why it was a bit more than normal. But um, I don't know how much it sells for now, but for me, the £50 was definitely worth it. You start reading it and you think, well, hang on, why is this called Scandalous Times? And then you get into it. And honestly, there are certain times where my jaw honestly dropped some of the stories and what, what it said is completely like shocking, but it's compulsive reading. It's really good. So I definitely recommend it if you'd like to know more about John Nathan Turner. But yeah, he's he's a very interesting man altogether, um, John. Very interesting person, and um, yeah. So I hope I hope I've sort of done him justice and tried to, you know, show a difference. Because I feel like a lot of people can be quite harsh on J and T, which I understand because there's a lot of decisions which were a definite no no in his era. But I feel like we need to recognise the man behind J and T sort of thing, and just appreciate that. I do generally think he did try his best. He was exhausted at the end. Yeah, he didn't make every right decision ever, but. 
you know. So I just feel like I wanted to show, shed that sort of light on him. I'd love to know what your opinions are on JNT as well, what you know about him, if you've learned anything, sort of like what you think about him and his era, because I'd be really interested to hear. And also, please do like if you enjoyed the video. This one's been quite a long one. It's taken several weeks to put together. So just let me know you've liked it. If you have enjoyed it, then please leave it a like just so I know that you've enjoyed it as well. But thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video. It was a very long one, my longest ever. But I really hope that I did him just gave great detail and everything. So yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I hope you're happy to see me back. And hopefully I'll be uploading another video very soon. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.